unabashed. The most unpredictable becomes a headline. The most volatile outrageous behavior. Unsubstantiated narratives. A battle of personalities. Welcome to Grant Tamasha, a co-production of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace and the Hindu Sun Times. I'm your host, Milan Vaishnav. A quick programming note for Grantham Asha listeners, we have come to the very last episode of Season 5 of the show. This has been our longest season to date, with 22 episodes between February 1st and July 9th. As we've done in years past, we're going to take a short break to recharge our batteries. Huge thanks to our audio engineer, Tim Martin, executive producer, Cliff J. Pranata, and my Carnegie South Asia colleague, Jonathan Kay, for helping put the show together each week. We'll be back in September with all new episodes of the podcast. Until then, take care and stay safe. One year ago, Chinese and Indian forces traded blows in the remote Galwan Valley, resulting in the first deaths along the line of actual control since 1975. Months later, India would be hit by the coronavirus, whose precise origin story in China we still do not fully understand. Indian public opinion towards China has soured, and Beijing has nervously watched India double down on its engagement with the so-called Quad. It's against this backdrop that the scholar Kanthi Bajpai has released a timely new book, India vs. China, why they are not friends. Kanthi is the director of the Center on Asia and Globalization and Wilmar Professor of Asian Studies at the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy in Singapore. I am pleased to welcome him to the show for the very first time. Kanthi, good to talk to you. Great to be here. Thanks very much for doing this. So congratulations on the book. Uh, Before we get into the nitty gritty, uh, let me start with, you know, uh, how this book came to be. Since last year's flare up between China and India in Galwan, there has been a flurry of expert commentary trying to unpack the sort of evolving and changing nature of the relationship between China and India. At what point did you sort of have that moment where you decided that you had to sit down and write this particular book? You know, was there something missing you felt from the larger sort of commentary discussion? Yeah, thanks very much. Um, I think for the, you know, the prosaic kind of answer is that um, Juggernaut Press came to me and asked me to write this book uh, in um, July last year. Um, And I got down to work pretty much immediately. I banged it out in three months, finished it in October. Um, It took a little longer to hit the market because of COVID restrictions. And we didn't get an ISBN number in India for several months. Uh, uh, Who would have thought? But um, uh, Juggernaut thought there was a place for a a book that would provide an overview with a bit of attitude. Uh, I'm not sure they got exactly what they wanted. Uh, I think they probably wanted something shorter and punchier, but uh, that's the book that I wrote. Um, I think in terms of the literature, uh, there are three kinds, I think, that I was kind of working off or relating to and, and trying to somewhat differentiate myself uh, from. The first is kind of, there's a huge literature which is historical, related to the 1962 war and the border conflict. Um, and then there's a second set of analyses which take the story from 1962 onwards, but again, is mostly largely focused on the border and military security affairs. And then rather similar in in substance, again, military strategic, is kind of breaking news sorts of books um, that tell you, you know, kind of what's happened uh, just over the last few months or a couple of years and and try and look forward to uh, choices for India, particularly uh, more policy oriented. So this book certainly is not the third. It doesn't really do breaking news. Uh, it does look at the 62 border war, but it tries to go beyond it. Uh, it goes beyond, of course, uh, the events of, of 62 and, and, and thereafter, but it tries to go beyond the, um, the border war uh, to the four Ps, um, uh, which organize the book. So perceptions and a longer durée of history between the two. Um, and trying to uh, then secondly, of course, the perimeters, which is, you know, uh, the issue of the border itself, um, partnerships, which relates to how India and China relate to the two other big powers, the United States and the Soviet Union and Russia. And then finally, uh, the issue of power between them. And so I think, you know, the book tried to combine culture, history, geopolitics and strategy. I think there are books that are exclusively one or the other or maybe a couple of those topics. But we felt there was a need for a book that combined all four and that appealed to a general readership but might still appeal to a specialist. So I think that's the kind of uh, place that I hope the book is is situated in. So Kanthi, as you alluded to, you argue in the book that India and China are not friends for four key reasons, right? There's the issue of perceptions. There's the question of their territorial perimeters. There are differing strategic partnerships with the big powers, and those have changed over time. And then, of course, there's the asymmetry of power, the four Ps, as you put it. 
let's start with perceptions, right? I mean, one of the things that was so interesting to me as a reader is you went all the way back to pre-modern times in assessing how citizens of China and India viewed each other. You know, I think our listeners would be much more familiar with the kind of arc of perceptions, say, post the 62 war. But could you tell us a little bit about how things appeared in China and in India in the sort of earlier prehistory? Yeah, I think one of the, it was a learning experience for me as well. Uh, like so many people, uh, so many of your listeners probably, I was really focused on the period from about 1949 onwards. I just thought the long durée, the kind of big reach back into history was really pretty vital, particularly if I wanted to cult, uh, deal with some of the cultural issues. And so um, I decided to educate myself as much as I hope to educate readers. And I went back to the introduction of Buddhism uh, to China um, and then took the story, first of all, forward to about 1000, uh, uh, the year 1000 in the Christian era. So from the introduction of Buddhism to, to that time, I mean, it's fair to say that China really looked up to India uh, because of the religious uh, kind of uh, uh, link. Uh, particularly Chinese monks came to India. Uh, there was a flourishing trade, particularly in Buddhist relics. There was other trade as well, more secular trade, but uh, certainly Buddhism and stuff around it uh, became very important. And I think the broad point that I developed there is that uh, in terms of a kind of cultural respect, um, Chinese society came to look up to India. And now that's not true for all Chinese people. Uh, some segments of the elite did, some did not. Uh, eventually, Buddhism did kind of make its way to the Chinese court as well, and quite substantially to the elites. Um, but at the same time, there was a reaction against it. It was an effort to sinicize Buddhism, and even in some quarters to claim that it was originally a Chinese faith. Uh, that it was somehow linked to Taoism. Um, but nonetheless, I mean, I think for about you know, hundreds of years, up, up to, until 1000, the Christian era, um, China looked up to India. By about 1000, though, uh, partly because of Buddhism's decline in India, the links to India really began to decline. Um, and um, the regard became a thing of the past. There was still trade and contact, and especially through third places, such as Southeast Asia, most prominently. But the links with India began to decline, especially the religious links. And then we come to the period from the 15th century uh, sort of onwards. Actually, it's somewhat before that already. Parts of India were beginning to look up to China, but I would say it peaked in the 15th century when the famous Chinese uh, voyager and admiral Cheng He uh, steamed into, well, rode into or sailed into uh, the Indian Ocean. Uh, with his armada. And at that point, certain kingdoms in the Malabar, in southern India, and the Bay of Bengal area uh, began to look up to China. So roles were reversed. Uh, there were tributes uh, sent to the Chinese emperor uh, fairly regularly, and the Chinese, uh, uh, from time to time, uh, you know, uh, kind of uh, intervened, at least diplomatically and politically, in the affairs of some of these kingdoms, bestowing legitimacy and granting them trading rights. And the third phase, I think, is really the and this brings us up to a much more contemporary period, but it's very important for the contemporary period, and that's the late 19th century, where Chinese reformist intellectuals began to worry, of course, about the increasing European influence and domination of, of China. And they looked south or west, actually, I should say, to India, and asked themselves, why had a, such a flourishing and great civilization and such a, a large country um, fallen to the British? I mean sort of mere handful of, of white people. Um, and they concluded that uh, India was disunited and weak, uh, that uh, this was somehow almost intrinsic in India, and India divided by caste and religion and language and region and culture. And this had simply not allowed Indians to fight back, to come together and fight back. And there was a kind of a lament, uh, uh, and essentially the lesson was, don't be like India. Uh, it was a negative lesson. And so I think we come to a period here of Chinese disdain, really, for India, uh, which in many ways has endured right up to now. I mean, it's a fascinating history when you try to trace the roots of, of the disdain. Uh, speaking of roots, you know, I want to come to the issue of perimeters, right, uh, which also has quite lengthy roots. 
And, and you know, in this current moment, Kanti, there's a lot of litigating and relitigating of the past, particularly what happened in the 1950s and 60s under Prime Minister Nehru. You note in the book that there is a commonly held notion, it's a sort of piece of you know, received wisdom that Nehru and his contemporaries were quote unquote dreamy eyed idealists, right? When it came to international affairs generally, but the border situation with China more specifically. But you you conclude something very different that they in fact knew very well that from the start, uh, post 1947, China would be a major kind of thorn in their side, a major challenge, a major problem. What evidence do we have to kind of support this alternative interpretation? I think the most telling thing I refer to is um, a debate that broke out in 1948, um, initiated by K.M. Panikkar, the Indian ambassador. He was also a historian, of course, a famous uh, geopolitician and uh, uh, thinker and, and historian. But he was ambassador in Beijing. And in 1948, he already warned Nehru that China, with the communists coming to power most likely, China was likely to make claims against India, uh, territorial claims. I mean, the Guomindang had done so as well, and so had Tibetans. But he was obviously worried now about Mao and the communists. In the foreign office, at the head of the foreign office, was a man called Girja Shankar Bajpai, who was my grandfather, as it happens. And he was Secretary General of the Ministry of External Affairs, and arguably India's most seasoned diplomat, along with KPS Menon. And Bajpai was strongly anti-communist. He was very worried about China, much more so than Nehru or Panikkar. And when Chinese troops entered Tibet, he saw the border problem would soon affect, you know, the relationship. Uh, and he wrote to Sardar Patel because he couldn't get through to Nehru um, to get Patel to side with him. And Patel wrote a famous uh, letter to Nehru in uh, November of 1950, which is substantially a letter that uh, Bajpai had written to Patel. Um, unfortunately, Patel died soon after. But what this debate was, was in effect a debate between those like Panikkar, who wanted to confront China later about the territorial issue, hoping to postpone the day, hoping that India would begin to exert more control of its own territory, particularly in what is now Arunachal Pradesh, where India was rather thin on the ground administratively and militarily. And Bajpai and KPS Menon on the other side, who were part of what I call the sooner is better school. And they argued that it was better to confront China when China was weak and distracted after the events of 1949, uh, when Mao was still establishing control, and to tie a deal on the border to progress on Tibet. The Chinese wanted to integrate Tibet, and Bajpai saw an opportunity along with Menon to make that a, a condition for, you know, for, um, uh, for a border settlement. Nehru vacillated between the two. Uh, between the sooner and later faction, but eventually came down on the side of Panikkar, uh, agreeing that it wasn't a propitious time to uh, confront the Chinese or to raise the issue of the border. Uh, interestingly, just as a sidebar, China had exactly the same debate between a, a sooner school and a later school. And this explains some of the hesitations in the early years uh, on both sides to deal with the issue. Um, of course, Nehru is a bit of a, a, an ambivalent figure or had ambivalent attitudes there were times when he thought China was very dangerous and arrogant, uh, even at, at this juncture, uh, especially under the communists. Uh, but he did think that on the, on the whole, it was worth risking, uh, you know, the uh, postponement of the border issue so that the Chinese could be enticed into a partnership in Asia. And in any case, his own estimation was that the Chinese were very powerful militarily. So I think, you know, for Nehru to be fair to him, uh, it wasn't idealism. It was more that he wanted to lay low against a superior opponent and perhaps enlist that opponent in a common front. You know, your narrative about the perimeters, you know, uh, follows all of the twists and turns of this relationship over, over many, many decades. And, you know, at the end, you sort of come back to this idea that, look, after seven decades or more of independence, India and China still can't agree on anything vital related to their borders, right? And and you do point out that a big part of the answer is that there is a gaping trust deficit between the two, right? The two sides don't trust what the other is saying. They don't trust what the other is doing. You know, we have had so many decades of, of confidence building measures, of high level dialogues, of track twos, of track 1.5s, um, of other sorts of formal informal discussions. Why do you think it is that this 
chasm between the two when it comes to a, the fundamental issue of trust hasn't uh, been reduced, hasn't been whittled away. Yeah, I think this is a, an important issue. I mean, I think obviously when we say that trust is the problem, it all becomes a bit tautological. You don't trust, so you can't cooperate. And if you don't have a history of cooperation, you don't trust each other. Uh, in the book, I, I kind of, um, uh, well, I, I was lazy uh, intellectually there, and I just threw out the trust issue more or less. But I think, you know, on further reflection, um, I think we can sort of reconstruct the kind of reasons that, that go into the lack of trust. I mean, to give it a bit more richness and to get away from tautology. Um, so I think one reason is, and that this one it does appear in the book, is that uh, the two didn't have a rich diplomatic history between the two heartlands. I mean, there was Buddhism and there was trade uh, going back you know, hundreds of years, obviously, but um, between the emperor in China and you know, empires in India and regional kingdoms, there was very spotty kinds of diplomatic contacts. So they don't have a rich diplomatic history as a guidepost to, you know, to expectations between them and a sense that uh, both sides would deliver on, on, on commitments. I think that's the first answer. And the second one is that leading up to the negotiations, in the negotiations leading up to the 1962 war, um, three things happened that are quite, to me, quite clear. Uh, first of all, as I said, they both hesitated to raise the issue of the border. When they did raise it by about 1954, 95, uh, 1955, both often had very contradictory stands and, and actions, uh, and they were hard to interpret. Um, and thirdly, both made military moves that seemed to be aggressive to the other side, what IR scholars call you know, the security dilemma. Then you add all these up, looking at it from Delhi and seeing these three things, and then if you sat in Beijing and you saw the same, um, you might doubt the other side. What one side thought was, you know, caution and waiting to negotiate, uh, the other side might think uh, of as being kind of duplicitous and trying to cook up something. Um, when they took somewhat contradictory stands and actions, one side may have been scrambling to access its maps and records and kind of, you know, settle internal bureaucratic wrangling. Uh, the other side might have seen, um, again, an effort to mislead uh, an, an effort to uh, kind of uh, fool the other side and to be duplicitous. And military moves that were made uh, out of a desire to be to take a certain amount of understandable defensive actions and to assert control over territories that, frankly, they really hadn't historically um, had much control over. I mean, they were so far from the main centers of power. I mean, these moves might have been seen, on the other hand, as the first moves in more aggressive kind of control and and perhaps even preparations for an attack. So I think, you know, if you add up all those, it made them doubt each other. The next po point I do point to in the, in the book uh, is that they were never strategic partners against anyone, at least in the modern period. I mean, they were, uh, they were allies in the war against Japan, uh, but that was uh, between the Guomindang and the Congress Party, essentially, uh, and mediated by the British and, and the Americans. But after that, you know, they've never been partners. The Chinese... Uh, were on one side uh, with the Russians, uh, with the Soviets against the Americans. The Indians were with the Soviets against the Americans uh, and against the Chinese. The Chinese were, uh, uh, you know, with the Americans against the Indians and the Soviets uh, and so on. And right up to this day, uh, you have now a kind of tacit partnership between uh, the Chinese and the Russians and the Indians and the Americans. And so at the highest levels of strategic decision making, both civilian and military, they do not have a history of intense interaction and cooperation uh, where they learn to trust each other and, and interact with each other. I think the next reason, uh, really, the next couple of reasons have to do with domestic politics, and let me just play them quickly. One is domestic political uh, capacity. Uh, I pointed to the fact that, you know, they were all over the place in terms of their records and access to them and maps and, and so on, maybe coming out of the Civil War and their lack of own diplomatic uh, experience. And then there was the noise of their political systems. Uh, India is, as we know, open and noisy at the best of times. China is closed and enigmatic, but they were certainly wrangling internally, even during Mao's time. And so I think, you know, when they looked at each other, uh, they found either silence because of this domestic incapacity, uh, or uh, when China looked at India, it was noisy and they didn't know what to make of uh, the Indian debates. And I think India looking at China uh, sort of couldn't probe the system beyond a point and uh, interpret the actions of the Chinese either. And the other, I think, uh, telling point domestically 
is almost a personality issue, but maybe a political culture issue. Nehru and India were very legalistic, formalistic, and conservative about borders, building on a kind of European tradition of dealing with, you know, these kinds of matters. Whereas Mao and Joe, they were, Joe and Lai were revolutionaries. Uh, and they were very strategic about decisions that they make. And they saw legal issues and formal boundaries to, to a large extent as sort of bourgeois concerns, um, ones that could be uh, done away with and bargained uh, against and compromised if uh, strategic needs were, were uh, you know, necessitated that. So, um, so I think these are, you know, some very um, telling reasons, probably. I mean, they need to be probed more historically, but um, and add to this that finally that, you know, two big powers bordering each other, both seeing themselves as great putative great powers and great civilizations, uh, there'll be a tendency to be suspicious of each other anyway, I think, and be competitive. Um, so I think we can put some flesh and bones on the tautology of trust, uh, at least along the lines that I've tried to do. So a few minutes ago, you alluded to the ways in which China and India interacted with uh, other great powers, right? So that's a nice segue to the part of your book, which looks at these relationships, right? So there's this kind of complex tangle of relationships between India, China, the United States, the former Soviet Union, now Russia. At the end of that particular chapter, you conclude that, look, it seems like the present partnership of the U.S. and India on the one hand and China and Russia on the other, they seem durable, but there are certain endogenous and exogenous developments that could alter that strategic landscape. And I'm wondering if you could elaborate on what those might be, right? Because I think, you know, sitting in Washington, D.C., as I do, these sort of things appear, you know, I mean, yes, there's a trajectory, but, you know, kind of set in stone, right? Like we've kind of locked into this path dependency, but clearly there are things that could shake us out of that. I see your point. And I think that's kind of the, the conventional view increasingly, uh, especially in the United States. And that's a point I'll come back to in a minute. Um, uh, and uh, increasingly in India as well. But, I mean, I think um, uh, let's deal with the endogenous factors first, which means, you know, what are the things between these four powers uh, over the last 60 or 70 years that have tended to uh, affect how they see each other? And uh, let me just tick off a few points there. I mean, I think, um, first of all, one thing that could uh, change the India-US uh, kind of convergence is uh, if a rapprochement broke out between Washington and Beijing. Um, it's not the first time it would have happened, and it's not probably going to be the last time, but it's plausible, um, you know, and I think um, uh, certainly a, a rapprochement between the U.S. and China would alter things for India and China. And I mean, as early as 1962-63, when Kennedy was around, uh, the Americans were already looking. I mean, they'd just been in partnership with India during the war against China, but within a year, they were already looking at the possibility of a an opening to, to Beijing. Uh, it didn't go through because Kennedy was assassinated, but Johnson picked it up thereafter. And then I think we know the rest of the story under Nixon and Kissinger. But, you know, so these rapprochements can come quite suddenly and unexpectedly um, uh, from either side. Um, of course, there was a... And just to, just to interject on that, I mean, uh, you know, it, it is very clear to me that in the run-up to the current president uh, in the United States taking office, there were a lot of commentators in Delhi who openly worried about the the prospect of a quote-unquote G2, right? That Biden would come in, try to establish some kind of connect with, with Xi that would lead to some rapprochement, right? Which would then potentially leave India out in the cold. Now, that doesn't seem to be what has happened over the past couple of months. But as you say, these things um, have a history of surprising us. Yeah, exactly. Um, my point simply is that if one had to do a thought experiment on what are the circumstances in which it might happen, I mean, I think the first one is a possible uh, sudden U.S.-China rapprochement. Uh, if they do a deal on trade and a few other strategic things, uh, who knows? So that's the first one I think I, I would tick off. The second one is, I mean, very importantly, and I think we have a sense of this, is really if there was a change in India on how far it wants to go in leaving behind uh, its insistence on strategic autonomy. Now, at the moment, India seems to be edging away from very publicly talking about well, non-alignment. I mean, those words never pass Modi's lips anyway, but uh, even strategic autonomy, the moment India doesn't utter those words very publicly, but that could change. Uh, there's a tendency for India to 
uh, want to stand up for itself, to be seen as an autonomous center of power, a, a pole in the international system, but certainly to be an autonomous player in Asia. Um, and that could come back. I mean, uh, it's not, not beyond a possibility as, uh, at all. A third is, and again, I'll, I want to come back to that point uh, to see a couple more things on it. Uh, the third is Russia is worth watching. If it pulls away from China, um, and India is certainly trying to invest in trying to, you know, in, in keeping Moscow's partnership with Beijing limited by maintaining a defense relationship and a diplomatic relationship with Moscow. And now, of course, Biden has reached out to Putin as well. I mean, again, it, one would have to think uh, quite rigorously about exactly how a Russia that pulls away from Beijing would affect uh, the relationship between India and the U.S. and and then China. But I think, you know, things might be set in motion from that, that in this quadrilateral of powers, uh, one could see a change then in, in the India-U.S. relationship. Uh, mm -hmm. I'll just leave it there for now. Lastly, domestic politics. Uh, a lot of change comes from domestic politics. Um, now, there's some unease in the West uh, about changes in Indian politics. Uh, if India gets more authoritarian, less tolerant of, you know, pluralism within India, uh, these critical voices in the West might begin to be uncomfortable with too close a relationship to India, including the United States. Um, Mr. Modi, we've seen, I mean, he is has a penchant for dramatic moves, demonetization, the GST, uh, suddenly going off, uh, reaching out to China to meet uh, Xi Jinping in Wuhan, and then inviting him to Mamalapuram about a year later, uh, making a speech in Singapore in 2018, where he talks about a free and open Indo-Pacific, and then adds inclusive, uh, gesturing towards China being a possible member of a free and open Indo-Pacific. Um, so I think uh, Modi, uh, out of his own domestic politics, uh, perhaps has a penchant for all kinds, and his own personality and political style has a penchant for dramatic moves. And who knows if he suddenly sees it's in, in his interest to go back to a softer relationship with China and downplay the America relationship. And likewise, in the United States, um, you know, can distractions out of the sort of political polarization that's still very much in existence in America, uh, despite Trump's loss, and maybe increasingly because of his loss. Um, I mean, if that leads to a retrenchment of the United States from Asia, uh, then again, the India-US relationship may flounder. Um, lastly, I mean, of course, there's domestic politics in China, and that's a bit impenetrable. Uh, but who knows? Is Xi Jinping necessarily uh, without contention uh, back home? Uh, if there were moves in China, uh, perhaps a game between India and China could change as well. You know, uh, this raises the question of, you know, as you look out, how do you assess the sort of power balance between China and India, right? And that is one of the, the P's that you look at. And I found it at first glance rather counterintuitive that you argue that it is China, not India, that has the soft power advantage, right? I think um, a lot of us would look at India and say, okay, this is a democracy, maybe a flawed one, but a democracy, a relatively open society, purveyor of things like Bollywood, of, of Indian food and the like, um, and that India clearly has the the upper hand on the score, but then you actually go through this quite compelling uh, argument to 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 say you know the opposite actually that, that that there are a lot of soft power advantages that China retains, and I and I think it'd be interesting if you could elaborate on what some of those might be. Yeah, so first of all, of course, we we know what soft power is. It, it's a bit of a slippery construct, but essentially it means the power of getting others to do what you want by means of attraction and persuasion. So people are attracted to you they're more likely to be persuaded to do what you want them to do. And Joseph Nye, uh, who originated the idea of soft power in IR, um, really focuses on three dimensions, foreign policy influence, cultural pro uh, projection, and one's political values. Those are the three things that, in a sense, can uh, attract countries uh, to you um, and uh, do your bidding. Um, there's a larger view of soft power. I mean, there are things that you point to uh, classical and popular culture, the movies, the arts and letters, cuisine, uh, that kind of stuff. Um, I don't really deal with those. Uh, so to be fair, I take a narrower view, uh, a very Joseph Nye kind of view, uh, I suppose. And I looked around for measures of it because, I mean, even Nye's three um, elements or dimensions are kind of difficult to put your uh, hand on very um, 
uh, very palpably. So uh, luckily, the Australian Lowy Institute uh, has done, amongst other things, a study of elements that relate to these three dimensions of soft power. Um, and what those show, and I just kind of played around with them, um, they show that on foreign policy influence, there are several measures, but the basic measure is of how others look at your foreign policy leadership or your international leadership. And their measure or measures show that China pretty consistently, uh, its leaders are shown to be more efficacious at showing global leadership or regional leadership in Asia. So that's the first. On cultural pr uh, projection, they look at a whole bunch of things, but uh, just to name a few, how many world heritage sites do you have You know that people know about? Uh, how many tourists do you get? Because obviously, if you're getting people coming into your country, inbound tourists, uh, they're getting to know you, they're attracted to you. Uh, they might uh, maintain those, you know, those impressions and be persuaded by you on other issues. And then they also look at, you know, numbers of inbound foreign students that countries receive. And again, uh, you know, if they study in your universities and your schools, uh, they might be more persuaded of your point of view. And in all those measures, India comes well behind. I mean, on tourism, it's not even close. Uh, I think India, China bests India by a factor of something like 10. Um, and on inbound students, likewise. So uh, China has enormous uh, leads there. It's on the third one, on political values, where it's a bit more even. Uh, but even this is surprising, because as you sort of said, you might expect that India as the democracy, as the open society, as a more pluralistic kind of uh, political culture, uh, that it would be more attractive and would, you know, would get the respect of other Asians. Now, I should underline, the Lawi measures are for what Asians think of other Asians, including the United States, by the way. Um, but Asians, I mean, they're not all in love with democracy and openness necessarily. Um, and so it's not surprising that uh, India and China actually score pretty evenly here. I think in part, you know, there is an argument that Asians value not so much democracy and openness, but governance competence, getting things done. And I think they may fear China, but Asians see China as a country that gets things done. And I don't think they see India as a country that gets things done. I don't want to dismiss concerns of hard power because obviously that's something that you devote a lot of time to, right? In addition to this question of soft power. But if I could just ask you one thing as it relates to hard power, um, kind of towards the end of that section where, you know, you, you, I think you ultimately conclude saying that the hard power differentials are perhaps not as stark uh, as, 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 as one might uh, expect. Um, particularly given the complications of technology, of geography, of nuclear weapons, right? I mean, there's quite a complicated equation if you were to try to think about this quantitatively. But nevertheless, um, there are certain scenarios in which China and India might come to blows, um, leaving aside, uh, as you put it, the prospect of a kind of Chinese outright war to take back Ladakh or something. I'm just wondering if you could sort of walk us through, as you see it, what some of the most likely scenarios might be uh, in, in, in how a kind of Cold War could turn hot. Yeah, so I, I, I do discount, as you say, the prospect of a kind of war of conquest of Ladakh, but I think there are three scenarios there uh, short of that. The first is what I call an attack along a broad front, as in 1962. So there are three sectors of the India-China border the uh, western sector in Ladakh, the middle sector, which is a small one, and then the eastern sector, which is so-called Arunachal Pradesh. So in 62, there was an attack really across the, the broad front. That's scenario one. Scenario two is an attack in um, key sectors, just in you know parts of either the western sector or the eastern sector, where the Chinese uh, can concentrate and, and achieve local superiority towards certain kinds of tactical gains. And scenario three is um, to go behind India's front lines, to infiltrate, you know, on the ground or uh, via airdrop special forces and, uh, uh, you know, exert a, a, a double attack on, on India, a frontal attack which serves to distract and pin down Indian forces at the border. And then you have uh, special forces that uh, collect in the back and attack uh, India from the rear as well and maybe uh, fan out a bit. So um, those are the three scenarios. Um, the first one, the broad front, what would be the objective? I mean, I think this would be essentially a kind of punitive or bargaining war to get India to accept economic or political conditions that China wants, 
perhaps to lower India's standing internationally, uh, but maybe most of all to use territorial gains as a final set of bargaining chips towards a, a border settlement. Um, the attack in key sectors um, is, would really be with the objective of protecting Chinese infrastructure, so more defensive, I think, and to put Indian infrastructure at a disadvantage. And we know in the dark in 2020, um, the, the Chinese incursions seem to have been directed against the extension of a road from uh, Leh northwards up to the Karakoram Pass. So um, that's a, a, you know, kind of the objective if they were to attack in a, in a key sector is to gain control or to threaten uh, Indian infrastructure. In both these cases, as you said um, quite rightly, um, you know, I point out the terrain and ge or geography uh, and India's ability to counterattack are difficulties for China. So that even though China, in, in terms of, uh, you know, big numbers, numbers of tanks and planes and, and artillery pieces and so on, has a distinct edge, sometimes uh, uh, some orders of magnitude bigger than India. But actually, these are mediated or moderated by terrain and the possibility of, of counterattacks. I mean, just take a few uh, examples. I mean, terrain, uh, these forces are fighting at between, or would be fighting between, at a height of between 4,000 and 6,000 meters. The air is rare. You can't get oxygen in your lungs. Uh, it's freezing cold even in the summer. It's, it's horrible. Uh, it takes troops to get acclimatized. Even when they're acclimatized, they can hardly breathe and fight for very long. Uh, I notice that, you know, we generally think of the 1962 war as being a month long. In fact, in terms of actual fighting days, it was 11 days long. Uh, it's the shortest war that India has ever fought in the modern period uh, after 1947. Uh, so that gives you an idea of how difficult it is to fight there. Um, uh, up at those, uh, uh, you know, in those geographical reaches, there's a logistics problem. Um, you know, the very things that make it difficult for India to supply their troops, because the Indians have to go up these sharp, twisting and turning roads to the heights. The Chinese are sitting on a Tibetan plateau looking down for the most part. But if they were to penetrate through Indian defenses, they would have to come down those very same difficult Indian roads and they would be, frankly, very vulnerable to Indian counterattacks by air, or artillery, or missile fire. Um, and then you have the possibility of Indian counterattacks on the ground. Uh, so uh, India may be locally superior in certain places uh, where they could um, uh, make ingress into areas of Tibet, uh, where they have the numbers of the heights and put pressure on China uh, with the possibility of trading that finally against uh, territories that they've lost. Also note that Tibet is a flat landscape, which means that uh, Chinese forces on the plateau are very visible to Indian um, uh, reconnaissance and air attack, both by airplanes and by missiles. So reinforcements from China are very visible and very prone to, to being in, in interdicted by, by, China, by Indian attacks. So, you know, I mean, India will certainly be under pressure, uh, but it's not as a foregone a conclusion that the Chinese will win. Finally, on the special forces attack, just very quickly, that's the third scenario. I mean, here again, the objective is very local, some tactical gains in a sector, um, not to lop off huge amounts of territory or to punish India beyond a point, but it's the riskiest operation. Uh, these special forces could, if the Indians react quickly and, and the Indians are probably been waiting for them, uh, if they isolate them, they'll destroy them and decimate them. And the Chinese will have not only a small military disaster, but a public relations disaster on their hands to know that the special force that was parachuted in there so adventurously uh, has now been uh, decimated and taken prisoner, and for sure the Indians will play it up. So it just seems to me that, you know, it's not an open and shut case for a Chinese victory here, uh, even though China is miles ahead in economic power, has an edge in soft power. But having said that, um, we need to look to the future. And, you know, this is a picture I've just sketched in of what's called a linear battlefield two antagonists fighting each other face to face, more or less, but there's technology. And you may have a non-linear battlefield where things are going on simultaneously in three space or four space, which is to say artificial intelligence, robots, drones, uh, you know, pinpoint accurate, uh, accurate hits coming from, uh, at you from all kinds of uh, directions, thanks to satellite reconnaissance, um, and uh, you know, anti-aircraft and anti-missile systems that have great capabilities, 
uh, that could knock Indian uh, retaliation out of the sky. You know, in these areas, um, India has fallen behind. You write that India has yet to develop the soft and hard capabilities necessary to catch up with India, but that they're also missing a key part of this kind of social infrastructure, right? And I'm wondering if you could say more about what you see as India's shortcomings when it comes to social infrastructure, right? And what what do you think needs to change in your view? So first of all, there's soft infrastructure. And by this, I mean uh, policy capacity. And I think this just refers to how much of a strong bureaucracy do you have? Does it have access to high quality data and information? Uh, does your government make you know, good laws in real time? Um, and does it, in other words, have in sum uh, political administ- administrative structures that can mobilize the larger public for collective goals? Um, I mean, if you want to catch up with China, the main collective goal is catching up on power And so you've got to mobilize people for the responsible pursuit of power over a long period of time. Do you have the political, bureaucratic, administrative structures for that? The second is hard infrastructure, and that I think we all know what that is. But include in that not just military capabilities, science and tech and, you know, uh, bridges and transport and energy and all of that, but also mass education, affordable health care. Do you have a skilled and, and healthy population? Um, do you have uh, a sustainable agriculture? So that's hard infrastructure, a key element, I think, of national power. But what I end with is this idea of social infrastructure, which really refers to, um, you know, the emancipation of the vast majority of your people. Are you still a feudal or a semi-feudal society with uh, types of servitude that really almost look medieval and and uh, really very terrible out there. Um, uh, It might be in the form of caste. Uh, There may be forms of stratification that are softer than caste, but they're Um, class-bound. There may be gender inequities. And of course, there may be urban-rural inequities that are are quite significant. And all this requires radical social reform. And in essence, I mean, I think, you know, China did this from 1949 onwards. it moved, I mean, if one had to focus on one once or two things, a, a massive set of very painful reforms that emancipated people. Now, we may not like Chinese methods, uh, and millions of people lost their lives or had blighted lives, but in effect, people were emancipated. Um, and the second thing the Chinese did gradually and ever more quickly is they moved people from the countryside into the cities. And India, frankly, at this point, really hasn't succeeded in doing either. I mean, just take rural to urban, India is still about 37% rural uh, uh, urban population. China's passed the 50% uh, mark. Most of Asia, even Pakistan, has gone well past that. So India is still a very rural-based population. Um, And so, you know, making massive social changes when you're still rural is a very difficult thing to do, it seems to me, if you look back historically to other societies. And India has to do all of this reforms, emancipation, urbanization, all of this um, at a time of two very big limitations that India faces, which the Chinese didn't. And the first of those is protectionism, economic protectionism, and a dialing back of globalization that, you know, globalization we know helped China massively. And the second is climate change. Um, India is going to have to carry out its economic reforms and catch up at a time when climate change is pressing in on the world. So I think that, you know, more than just catching up on GDP and and high-tech weapon systems and forging alliance systems with the Americans or whatever it is, India needs what I call a civilizational change. uh, Social infrastructure change is civilizational change. And that's not civilizational change, let me be clear, back to some kind of, you know, a reversion to some golden age. It's movement forward to a modern, experimental, you know, a, a sustainable um, uh, future. And I think I, I want to end with this thought that this power gap is so important because it means two uh, things to the India-China relationship that I didn't get a chance to, to, to underline, but which is important. From a position of strength, the Chinese don't feel the need to be accommodative towards India. And India, from a position of relative weakness and increasing weakness, at least in the economic uh, realm, 
uh, doesn't have the the wherewithal or let's say the, the courage or the luxury of accommodating the Chinese or conceding, uh, making concessions to the Chinese, because that would appear to be a, a strategic surrender. And no Indian political leader, I think, and not even Modi, uh, can afford to do that. My guest on the show this week is Kanti Bajpai. He's the author of a brand new book titled India versus China, Why They Are Not Friends. Uh, it's published by Juggernaut Books. Kanti, thank you so much for, for writing this book. I think it illuminated a number of issues for, for those of us who, who struggle to understand the history, uh, but also you know, helps to put the contemporary moment in the proper kind of historical context. Um, so congrats on the book and thanks for joining us. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Grant Masha is a co-production of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace and the Hindu Sun Times. This podcast is an HT Smartcast original and is available on htsmartcast.com, India's fastest growing podcasting producing platform. This was a Hindustan Times production Spotify, brought to you by HT Smartcast. Don't forget to rate and review. HT Smartcast. Show. And to find the writing we referenced on this week's episode, visit our website, grantthamasha.com. Production assistance comes from Jonathan Kay. Tim Martin is our audio engineer, and Cliff Jayapranada is our executive producer. Thanks for listening, and see you next week.